Hey, good morning. Well, or this afternoon, or I suppose this evening, depending on when you're actually watching it. But for the live viewers, it's the morning and happy Friday. Uh, I am Christopher Nudo. I am an attorney that serves the uh, Arlington Heights, Elgin, Northwest uh, suburbs of the Chicagoland area. And uh, we focus on estate planning, uh, small business, real estate, and uh, not-for-profit work. Um, you're here today because we have some exciting uh, topics to cover. And um, so let's just jump right into it, shall we? Um, today, I'm here to discuss uh, real estate, um, a family trust, uh, which is really uh, nothing more than a regular trust. Uh, it, it, trusts are all about just application. And um, in this instant, um, we're going to just be talking about uh, a trust and its interface with uh, uh, your, uh, your trust and its interface with real estate. Uh, additionally, we're going to put in a little smattering this morning for uh, kids leaving for college and uh, the necessary or should I say highly recommended documentation you should have as your child leaves for school. Uh, these are just and a lot of the stuff that I'm, we're covering today is very Illinois specific. Uh, so uh, hold on tight because here we go. Uh, I'm going to uh, begin by talking about uh, what options you have when you own real estate. So when purchasing real estate, uh, if you, and we're talking about the investing type, this is the home that you want to rent. This is the commercial building you want to rent. We're not talking about your primary residence. That's a topic for a whole nother discussion. Today, we're talking about if you want to get involved in investment real estate, or if you want to, um, uh, uh, you already are an investor in real estate and you uh, want to make sure that you're set up in the best way possible. Now, basically, uh, there are three ways that you can hold title to real estate uh, that is recommended, actually four. Uh, the first one is just holding it in your own name. Uh, that is for sure very simple. Uh, it is the least expensive, uh, but it comes with the greatest amount of exposure. Second, you could hold title uh, to real estate in a limited liability company. This is the often the vehicle of choice for people that uh, are gonna invest in multiple pieces of real estate over the years uh, and probably gives you the best protection. Uh, in between those two, you have holding property in trust. And uh, when it comes to trust, there are two different options. One option is because we live here in Illinois, you have an Illinois land trust. And the second is some form of other trust, but most commonly, uh, the grantor living trust is the trust used. So what are some of the considerations you should think about when choosing the right uh, vehicle to hold title to your investment property? Well, let's first talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, who you are and what your goals are. If you're just going to buy, uh, let, let's say you are um, moving into a new home. You've decided you've outgrown the home that you're currently in and you're going to buy a new home. And you don't need the money from the sale of your current home to buy your new home. So your idea is you're going to rent your current home and you're going to turn it from your primary residence into some form of income property. Well, there's, um, I would recommend two different uh, ways to approach this. The first one would be just leave it in your name alone. Now, in my brain, I'm thinking that you are a married couple and the home is owned 
by uh, the two of you. And so it's owned in some form of joint tenancy. Joint tenancy means that if one of the spouses dies, then the other one is the sole survivor to the property. If you own the property in joint tenancy uh, or tenancy by the entirety, and you then uh, buy your new home and turn this home into a rental property, then one of the simplest ways to manage the property is to just leave it in your name alone and get lots of good insurance. Insurance is your best defense sometimes against problems that can occur with a rental. This is a very inexpensive and very comprehensive way of dealing with it. Second, if we're really concerned, not necessarily about the liability issues, but rather um, succession, if you and your spouse should die, for instance, who would own the home and how would it transfer to whomever could manage it or sell it, etc., then this is where moving the property into either an Illinois land trust or some sort of grantor living trust would make a lot of sense. If you because both vehicles permit for the transfer of the property upon the death of uh, both uh, people who own the property. Coincidentally, starting January 1st of this year, 2020, I should say, starting January 1st of next year, 2022, um, Illinois has uh, revamped the transfer on death statute and will permit also for the filing of a transfer on death instrument. Uh, so then you will have multiple ways in which to transfer the interest to the home in the event that both husband and wife passed away. Now, um, you say, Chris, that's all nice, but I'm much more sophisticated than that. Uh, I have uh, multiple rental properties or I intend on buying multiple rental properties. How should I be set up? Well, that is an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. So um, my recommendation is uh, in a perfect scenario, you create a limited liability company and you place a piece of rental real estate in that limited liability company. And you do that for each per piece of uh, investment real estate that you buy. You heard me right, one LLC per piece of real estate. So if you have six rentals, you have six LLCs. Now you may say to yourself, Gosh, that seems like a lot of money and setup and maintenance and possible tax returns, et cetera, et cetera. And the point is, you're right. So there are ways around this to make it not so cumbersome. But why do we make these recommendations? Uh, we make them because what we're trying to do is create silos. And each piece of real estate put into its individual limited liability company silos or protects that piece of real estate from any uh, a type of um, casualty so it does not uh, it does not spill over into another piece of rental property for instance uh, you have a rental uh, where something bad happens somebody dies in the property and it's not by a natural death maybe it's a murder and um, it, it, for some reason, you as the landlord are being held responsible in some form of negligence. So uh, you're being sued. If your property is uh, siloed in its own limited liability company, then any exposure that spills over from that negligence lawsuit will not affect your other pieces of investment property. See how it is encapsulated, it is siloed uh, from the other property that you own. This includes your personal property as well is protected because the only thing that is exposed is that piece of property and the LLC that is in it. So um, I, I mentioned that, you know, 
these items can be very complicated at times from a paperwork standpoint, management standpoint. And that's why I always recommend if you're going to be a big real estate investor, you should create your own management company. This is one company that manages several pieces of real estate. This is how you can combine the, um, you can have one vehicle that manages multiple pieces of real estate without having separate books for each piece of real estate. And this is how you can eliminate multiple checkbooks. And there's, there's, there's all kinds of benefits to having a management company that manages all of your rentals. Uh, finally, uh, we had talked about trusts and uh, the fact that a trust can be used. And when should I use a trust? Well, you should use a trust to manage your real estate. Number one, if you're not considered a real estate investor. So if it's just a hobby that you're doing, or like I mentioned in the beginning, it's a piece of real estate that you once lived in and now you're renting because you bought a new piece of property, I wouldn't consider you a um, professional real estate investor. It would be more of a hobby kind of thing. That's where we can use an Illinois land trust or we can use a grant or a living trust uh, or uh, starting in 22, we can use a transfer on death instrument. So which of these is the right vehicle for you? Well, a lot depends. You know, one size does not fit all. So uh, a, a land trust is a good vehicle uh, if you want to try and create some anonymity, uh, keeping your name out of the public record as much as possible. A, a grantor living trust is a great vehicle if we want to take into consideration all of your other assets that you have and uh, do some uh, more extensive estate planning and keeping your properties out of probate in the event that you uh, pass away. And finally, um, uh, the transfer on death instrument, great vehicle, but again, not available until December, uh, January of 2022. All right. So if you have any further questions with regard to this topic, uh, we just skimmed the surface on it. Uh, but yeah, this is just a little uh, introduction to um, when we should consider limited liability companies, trusts, and uh, just owning property outright in your own name and uh, the pros and cons. Now, um, one of the other topics, uh, it's kind of timely. Uh, it's uh, early August and uh, uh, when I'm recording this and um, kids are getting ready to go back to college. And I strongly recommend that parents have power of attorney for healthcare and power of attorney for property uh, for their students that are heading back to school. And the reason for this is uh, uh, in the event that your student ends up with some kind of uh, severe illness or injury while at school, you want to have documentation on hand that lets the medical providers, the first responders know that you have permission to act on behalf of your child. And uh, this is not something that is just granted naturally through the law, especially if your child is out of Illinois. Uh, it, this differs from state to state. So I always recommend that a parent hold a healthcare power of attorney over their child so that in the event of uh, some tragedy, um, the, the parent has the legal authority to speak on the child's behalf. This is also true with regard to financial decisions. So. Uh, if there should be an event at college which renders your child not uh, uh, incapacitated in some sense, and you need to speak on your child's behalf, having power of attorney for property can save the day. Again, as you change state lines, as, as kids go to uh, school in other states, even here in Illinois, if the time arises where a parent needs to step up and have the authority and your child is over the age of 18, then uh, having a power of attorney for property is very, very, very important. So uh, the, that's just my little uh, college tip for the day. Um, I think we have... Um, 
a couple of questions. Um, I think I'm going to do a quick uh, summary here, and then we're going to um, uh, go to questions and wrap up. It's going to be a light show today. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that a uh, couple times a month, I am here on Facebook Live sharing legal tips and guidance for parents and guardians and uh, uh, students and just about everybody um, on little things that are in my wheelhouse that I can share and help you uh, in the law. And uh, so today we talked about uh, if you're a real estate investor or just a casual real estate owner that rents property, uh, what are some of the best ways to hold title to those properties and why? And uh, we also uh, gave an encouraging tip to parents and students heading back to college and the use of powers of attorney and why parents should have them. We're going to take a few questions uh, here and then we'll wrap it up. So um, our first question is a big one. I believe I did an entire video on this. Um, but the question is, what is the difference between a will and a living trust? And uh, in Illinois here, uh, there are myriads of differences between wills and living trusts. But anecdotally, um, why does one use one over the other? And I would tell you that living trusts are used the vast majority of time for two key reasons. Number one, they avoid probate if properly used. And number two, uh, they are aids in uh, taking full advantage of the estate tax laws here in Illinois. A will, on the other hand, is a document that we use only in instances where the estate is very small or very uncomplicated and uh, we don't have probate issues to deal with. When I analyze an estate and decide whether I'm going to recommend a will or a trust, the very first analysis I do is how many of the assets does the individual or couple own that are potentially probate assets? And then uh, the more probate assets they have, the more likely it is I'm going to recommend a trust over a will. Uh, next question that came in is uh, when someone passes away and uh, their will is read, why aren't the assets transferred then? Okay, there's two things there. First of all, the whole concept of when your will is read, um, that is a Hollywood thing. We don't actually do the reading of the will. This is not where we sit around the big table like they did in the movie Clue and read the will. Um, uh, um, uh, also, that aside, let's assume there was a reading of the will and we all thought we were on some kind of Hollywood movie set. Um, the assets are not transferred then simply because a will must be admitted to the probate court of the county in which the individual died. Once before um, assets, uh, before the executor in the will can have the authority to transfer any assets, the will must be admitted to the probate court. Um, creditors must be given six months notice in which to file a claim. And uh, then uh, at the end of that period, if uh, all creditors are satisfied, then uh, assets can be transferred. So assets cannot be transferred through a will uh, anytime uh, soon after an individual has died uh, because of the Illinois Probate Act, which gives creditors the first six months to um, lay claim to any uh, assets in the estate. Next question. Um, who is the best person to designate as the executor of my will or the trustee of my trust? Uh, the answer is somebody who is fiscally responsible and extremely trustworthy. Simple enough. Next question. Um, can I include non-family members as beneficiaries of a trust? Yes, that's the beautiful thing about a trust and a will is that you can name just about anybody as the um, uh, benefactors of a will or a trust. Uh, this includes charities, 
Um, it includes uh, ministries such as churches, it includes uh, your best friend, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can include just about anybody. Family members can be excluded, by the way, included. It doesn't matter. Everybody's treated equally. Uh, next question, how much does it cost to work with an estate planning lawyer? Well, not as much as you would think. Um, working with an estate planning lawyer is probably one of the best investments you can make because we're going to take a very holistic approach to your estate. We are going to look things over um, and we are going to recommend the appropriate tools to ensure that um, we don't use a cannon to shoot a mouse. Um, but rather we use, um, you think of the three bears, we're going to pick the porridge that is just right for you and your family. Um, and uh, so when you are done, you will have paid for the perfect uh, blend of estate planning documents for your family. Uh, that's why I always recommend that you get this done with a professional. Uh, what is the difference between working with a lawyer and doing the paperwork yourself online? Well, the difference is significant. Number one, uh, working with the right professional is going to ensure that the documents that are prepared are prepared uh, properly. Number one. Number two, that they are executed properly. Um, when doing your doing your uh, as, when doing your estate plan yourself, uh, do it yourself kind of kit. Um, those actually are in some cases not terrible um they are designed uh, uh with a minimalist approach um but they uh are not bad documents or i haven't seen a, a terrible document um but here's where things get uh wonky and that is uh, a lot of times in the execution the documents are not signed appropriately there are a lot of uh, necessary steps that need to be taken from uh, multiple witnesses, the amount of um, uh, language that is used uh, for the witnesses, the uh, um, uh, the notaries that need to be involved, and um, how everything is done in a way that perfectly um, uh, puts the documents together so that when you die, the documents uh, can be used uh, to do what you want them to do. Oftentimes, what will happen is a um, person will do their will themselves. Uh, they will not get it executed appropriately. Uh, they will die. The, tr the will will be of no value. And then people are extremely disappointed. So I always caution do-it-yourselfers um, that there are two steps to the process. One is the drafting of the documents. Second is the formal execution of the documents. Um, next question. Um, do I offer virtual appointments or on-site visits? Yes, it's not an or, it's an and. Uh, I do uh, do uh, virtual visits. And uh, what I would say is um, these are great for people who are uh, not in their, uh, who are shut, up, shut in their home uh, and or their schedule is such that they cannot get out. But I will tell you face-to-face -face visits are the best. And uh, under uh, appropriate circumstances, I will travel to you and meet with you in your home because I truly believe the face-to-face -face visit is better than the virtual visit. But yes, all types are offered. Um, and finally, where can I contact you to set up a consultation? Well, look at that right there in the lower third of the screen. You see my telephone number, a number that you can text. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, an email available uh, that they'll put up and our address, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that is really the best way to contact our office. I will tell you that when you call, there is a high degree of likelihood you're going to meet Stephanie. She is amazing. She answers the phone. She will greet you and take in all of the necessary information to make sure that the office can do a proper evaluation of your situation. She is going to be courteous and she definitely is going to care for you and what needs to be done. Um, once you've spent that time with Stephanie, then uh, we move to the formal consultation and that is our process and procedure here. So I often recommend people to contact our office simply by a phone call or a text and you will get things started. 
Well, I want to thank all of you for joining me here this morning. Um, it's been fun. I cherish the opportunity to share this information with you. And um, uh, if you ever have questions regarding any kind of estate planning, wills, trust, uh, probate, somebody in your family has passed away, please consider us as your resource. And um, you, I invite you here again uh, two weeks from now on Facebook Live. Notificate, you'll get notification. You'll see um, uh, promotions leading up to the next topic. And uh, please, it would be my honor if you would invite your friends and share this video with your friends, families, and other professionals. Um, that is uh, no, no greater of a thing than, uh, than I could ask. So I hope to see you again in a couple weeks and uh, you have an awesome weekend. God bless. Have a great day.